Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Hello. My name is Kim Havens. I'm the event manager here at an unlikely bookstore in Plainville, Massachusetts. I'm in the bookstore. Jeff is upstairs on the third floor. I am so excited to welcome Temple Grandin to celebrate the release of her new book, The Outdoor Scientist. And she is joined in conversation tonight with Jeff Kinney. Before we start, I have a couple of technical tips. If you have any issues with your video or audio quality, try refreshing your page. And if that doesn't work, just leave the presentation and log back in using Google Chrome as your browser. I just did it two seconds ago and I came right back. If you have any questions for Dr. Grandin, you can enter them in the um, ask a question box at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible at the end of the discussion. If you would like to buy a copy of The Outdoor Scientist, there's a big green button on the center bottom of your screen. And Dr. Grandin was kind enough to sign book plates. So when you order that from us, you will get a book plate as long as supplies last and then we'll have to ask her to sign some more. Oh, no, I signed some more. Now, I really signed them. They're not printed. I actually did sign them. <laughs> Excellent. Dr. Grandin has a PhD in animal science from the University of Illinois and is a professor at Colorado State University. She's the author of 12 books on autism and animal behavior, including the national bestsellers Calling All Minds, Thinking in Pictures, and Animals in Translation. Dr. Grandin has been inducted in the National Women's Hall of Fame in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in 2018, she was made a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Grandin lectures to parents and teachers throughout the United States on her experiences with autism, and she has something in common with Jeff Kinney. In 2010, she was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of the Year, and there's an HBO movie based on her life starring Claire Danes that received seven Emmy Awards. And Kate McHugh Day is with us again. Hello. Today, Dr. Grandin is going to talk about her new book for young readers, The Outdoor Scientist, in this book, Dr. Grandin introduces readers to geologists, astrophysicists, oceanographers, and many other scientists who unlock the wonders of the national world. She shares her childhood experiences and observations, whether on the beach, in the woods, working with horses, or gazing up at the night sky. It's a book about exploring the world around us, asking questions, and making sense of what we see with 40 fun outdoor activities that promote independent thinking. I know we're all eager to get back outside and get reacquainted with nature. And I know I spent my morning out in my backyard watching a family of foxes play around and it was just so cool. So joining Dr. Grandin is Jeff Kinney, best-selling author and the owner of this magical bookstore. And without further ado, it is my honor to welcome Dr. Temple Grandin and Jeff Kinney, welcome. It was great to be here. Thank you, Kim, that was a great introduction. I must admit, Dr. Grandin, I have had butterflies all day long. I, I'm so excited about this. I've interviewed a lot of authors, but I've never viewed, uh, interviewed a real life, a real live scientist, let alone one so famous and accomplished. Uh, I've always been a curious person, and I've often wondered about the way things work in the natural world. So this is my opportunity to learn a few things. Uh, and Dr. Grant, I want to say that this event has caused quite a stir in our community. We're used to virtual events of 60, 120 people if we're lucky. Uh, tonight, we're up to more than 500. Additionally, we expect about 2,000 people are watching on Facebook Live. So thanks to everyone who has tuned in. And I loved The Outdoor Scientist. I really loved it. It made me want to be a kid again. It made me feel like I missed out on so much when I was a kid. I'm sure this book will inspire kids to learn about the natural world, and it will set some kids on a lifelong journey of curiosity. I want to recommend it to everyone who's watching kids and adults. So Dr. Grandin, I've talked a lot already. Can you tell us why it was important for you to write a book like this for kids? Well, when I was a child in the 50s, all the things that I you know, I wrote about, we did as kids. You know, like my sister and I had a rock collection. We bust rocks open with a hammer. And uh, yeah, you better wear safety glasses for this, safety goggles, absolutely. And then we had our rock collection uh, on different shelves in the tool shed. Uh, all the things in this book are collecting shells on the beach. This is stuff that I did. Uh, taking buds apart at different stages of development, I did that. Um, you know, in the, in the 50s, kids would just go outside and play. 
You know, we'd take the maple keys off the trees and spin around. We'd stick them on our noses. That stuff we did, making daisy chains. Also things that, that um, we did, look at the night sky. Uh, now, one thing I didn't do as a child, but I did as an adult um, student in college, was an animal ethogram. That's one of the projects where you uh, watch an animal for a uh, certain length of time to see what it does. And I describe an ethogram of uh, that I assignment I had in a college class where I had to watch an animal for four hours. And my professor knew that I was into cats. He says, no, you cannot do cattle. I was told I'm not allowed to do cattle. I asked him if I could. And so I went to the zoo and I did antelopes that were living in a great big enclosure, sat there for four hours. And the most interesting thing that they did, like after I'd been there for several hours, is they put their males came up and they were gonna have a fight, but they did it through a chain link fence. They were in separate pens and they were sparring through the chain link fence. So their instinct was still there. That's really right. Right. And there was no way they could really fight because the chain link fence was there, but they still did that. So what that shows in animal behavior is you got some behaviors like walking or eating hay. They might spend quite a lot of time doing that, but then there's other behaviors they do very seldom, but they're in, but they're important behaviors. Yes. And so one of the projects is to do an ethogram. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I had a lot of fun after the book got written, I'd watching a squirrel bury a nut under a bush right next to my front door. Oh, that's really cool. And you try it. Yeah. The nut, he wouldn't put the nut on the ground because another squirrel might grab it. So he'd hold it in his mouth. Then he'd, yeah. some more, then he'd try it, put it in his mouth, dig some more. And a third try, he had it deep enough and then he covered it up and he left it. And that's just something I observed 10 feet from my front door yeah. this year. You know, so there's a lot of things to observe. Yeah. So I just got back from a book tour and we traveled through some of the most beautiful places in the West and Southwest. We traveled through Colorado, Wyoming, Nevada, Utah, Arizona. We visited Zion, Sedona, the Grand Canyon, more. I was with my 18 year old son and we even visited your campus at the University of Colorado on a college. In Colorado State. Colorado, Colorado State, State, I'm sorry, of course. I get the right place. I knew I was going to get that wrong. Um, but was part of the appeal for you in living in that part of the country because there was such good proximity to so many natural wonders? Well, it started out, um, you know, this brings up the whole thing about getting kids exposed to things. I get asked, how did I end up in the cattle industry? Well, I'm an Easterner raised uh, in the East. So a lot of the rocks that rusted up was granite. Yeah. And um, I then i had the opportunity to go visit my aunt's ranch when i was 15. i'd never been west of the mississippi before yeah and i really liked the west and i got introduced to cattle and students get interested in stuff they get exposed to yeah yeah and when we were in zion national park my son who's you know a lot of times he's he's looking at a screen sometimes his face is in a book but i've never seen him just sit he just sat on a log in zion national park and you know there was no phone. He clearly felt like he was at peace. And I asked him about it. I said, do you, do you feel something different here? And he said, yeah, I just, I just feel like I'm at peace. And I wanted to know where do you go when, when you most need to feel connected to nature? Where is your go-to place? Well, I've like to go has gone out in the pasture and I can lay down in the field and let the cows come up around you and I'll just lick you to death. Um, <laughs> sometimes I've done that. They'll just come up to you if you just stay still. Really? That's I really cool. with bulls. I would recommend <laughs> not that with bulls. But there's a scene in the HBO movie where Claire Danes did that, and the cattle just walked up naturally. I would recommend putting your hands this way, not out the way she had them. Right, right. That's a good. So that's you don't good accidentally step on your hand. Right. So one of my traveling companions asked about the rock formations at Zion National uh, Park and how they came to be why there were different colors in the rock layers. And I told her, I said, I'm gonna tell you everything I know, which really wasn't that much. I said, the mountains were either formed by tectonic plates being pushed together or were being worn down by the elements. I wasn't so sure. She said, why are there different colors in the rocks? I said, maybe it was a good year and a bad year, sort of like trees. And she said, well, what's gonna happen? I said, maybe everything will turn to sand eventually, or maybe the plates will get picked up together. I really realized I am a cartoonist and, and not a scientist. Um, can you give us a quick lesson on how that kind of formation happens? What what happens to make su such well, a- I am not a, I am not a geologist, um, but there's uh, one thing I'll tell you, an interesting thing I just learned about was that the people that made the camera for the Mars rover 
yeah. archaeologists. They love their rocks. Yes. So a bunch of Arizona State University professors got together to form a company to make the cameras. Yes. And um, you got rock lovers. That's one of the reasons you got those beautiful pictures. That's right. You got the more mathematical engineers had to get it there, but right. the other thing I'm getting very concerned about because I talk about the different kinds of minds all the time. The visual thinkers like me think in pictures, yes. the more mathematical minds, and the word minds. And lots of times the visual thinker doesn't get enough credit. I went and looked up pictures of those cameras sitting on a workbench. Yeah. Somebody did wiring by hand on that. Mm. It needs to get a lot more respect. Yeah, yeah. Because it's you need a mathematician to get it there. But right. somebody built those things on a workbench. Right, right. So I live in Plainville, Massachusetts, which is not too far from Dedham, where you grew up. And I really enjoyed reading about your childhood. You spent a lot of time in nature. Uh, can you tell us how you spent your days as a kid? Like when, you know, when on a summer day, what, what might be a typical routine for you? Oh, kite flying and toy airplane flying. Mm -hmm. I have another book. This was the um, earlier one, Calling All Minds. Mm -hmm. yeah. In this book, I have all my childhood aviation projects. Yeah. Little kites, parachutes, and I made a wire spreader bar thing to make it open up better open up more easily when I chucked it up in the air. I would spend hours experimenting with my aviation projects, flying kites. I just loved to sit and fly kites. I'd do it on the beach. I'd do it on a field that was next door. I would do things like send a message up the string to the kite. If it flew, it was something I liked. It was that simple. I spent hours doing that and hours making them work. You see, kids today don't tinker anymore. Yeah. And yeah, so when you were a kid, you really dreamed of, of flying. And of course, you got to fly many, many times. Um, I'm curious, is, is I, I read about Stephen Hawking in your, your book, how he got to experience zero gravity. Is there anything like that that's very sort of tactile and experiential that, that you would really like to experience if you had the chance? Oh, I'd love to go on one of these, um, you know, uh, orbital flights. Only thing yeah. that's really expensive. I'm um, but I geeked out totally on the first Dragon SpaceX Dragon spaceship going up to the space station. I did a two and a half hour geek out on the docking, watched the yeah. whole thing, yeah. completely geeking out on it. Had to do that. Yeah. Um, I think it's so cool. I'm a Star Trek fan. I thought it was so cool that Scotty's ashes were smuggled on the space station 14 years ago with a publicity <laughs> photo stuck inside a flight manual. And then <laughs> lifted up the floor and stuck it under the floor. And they just fessed up to it just recently. <laughs> that That's really hilarious. Well, let's yeah. talk about uh, exploring as a kid. You know, one of the things I, I noticed when I moved from the Washington, D.C. area to New England is that there are a lot of rocks laying around here, a lot of rocks that I don't I wouldn't see in the D.C. area. So how did they get there? Well, some of the things, as I said, I'm not a geologist. I haven't really studied that, but there's um, some rocks form in lava. I remember going to Hawaii, this was probably about 20 years ago. My, one of my first students, her dad lived in Hawaii. He was an extension agent. And we went there, we saw volcanoes uh, um, erupting. And we went to down this road and there was hardened lava mm -hmm. about this high up just in the, on the road. Well, that's yep. as far as you were gonna go. And we could actually see a volcano erupting. So some of it's, you know, volcanic rock that black smooth stuff wow i in the and, here in new england are they they were moved by glaciers is that correct i think yeah, i remember some of, that, some of that would be and then yeah. i found a really cool picture i went and visited a science teacher and she had something called orbicular granite so i actually got a picture of that in the book i took a picture of orb orbicular granite yeah pretty cool yeah and I you it was right there on um, orbicular granite that's really cool and that's something that you said that you um that you didn't get to discover on your own is there anything that you've ever held in your hands that is really sort of like the holy grail where you had to wait a long time to get to it and you finally got to hold something in your hands that was really special well i've hold held things from the space station in my hand and uh, that was pretty cool but yeah i'm really interested in in um I, I'm a visual thinker, and, I'm, and, and we need our visual thinkers. And I looked at this little experiment from the space station. I go, somebody made that on a workbench. Yeah. And that is something 
that doesn't get enough credit. It's like somebody made the camera. They got the little helicopter they're going to fly. Somebody made, people made that thing. Now, yeah, yeah the, the, the computer programmers put all, oh, it's got a Qualcomm Snapdragon chip in it. That's a chip out of a phone. And it's got this programming. Yes, you have to have that. But the visual thinker would have built the thing. You see, yeah. this is where you need both kinds of minds. The mathematician's got the Mars rover to Mars. I can't, right. well, that's a mystery to me how they navigate that. Right. But, some, but you see, this is where you have people with different kinds of skills, even in building right. factories. Yeah. Uh, you have some people do the clever engineering, and other people do the, like in food plants, the boilers and refrigeration, which is more mathematical. You need yeah. the whole, you need the whole team. Yeah. Um, worried about visual thinkers getting screened out with draconian algebra requirements. Yeah, it's funny because um, people ask me often, how do I come up with my stories or how, how do I come up with my jokes for my books? And I think actually the first thing I come up with is the image in my mind. Yeah. Like I, I have the image in my mind and then I write the whole story and then that's the last thing that I do is I take the thing that was the spark and then I put it down on uh, uh, paper. So I think, it, you know, it, I think in a sense I'm a visual uh, thinker, but not. Yeah, you not are. Um, when I was young, I thought everybody was a visual thinker. And it was obvious to me to look at what cattle were seeing going through shoots. And, and it was a shock to me to find out you've got some people that aren't visual at all. They're completely verbal. And if right. I ask them to think about a church steeple, instead of seeing specific ones the way I do, all they get is that. Right, right. And I was in my 30s when I discovered that. And that was kind of shocking to me. And there's actual research. I've got another book, The Autistic Brain, yeah. where I present the research to show that you've got some people are more visual, some people are more mathematical, and some are definitely more word. Right. And different kinds of minds need to learn to work together. They have complementary skills. And I had the chance today to watch the uh, the Claire Danes Temple Grandin movie. It must be pretty cool to have an, a movie with your name as the title. Um, no, but yeah. that, that's portrayed. There's a moment where that moment is portrayed when when a teacher is giving uh, you a hard time, and she, uh, you know your character can't believe that everybody doesn't think like like she thinks. Um, and I was I was curious how. How accurate is that that story in spirit? Well, the visual thinking is shown very accurately in the movie. There's a scene in there where the Lord's shoe is set, and a whole bunch of '50s and '60s shoes pictures show. Yes, that's accurate. And the projects I did that are shown in the movie are accurate. And the main people, like Carlock and Ann, and Ann out at the ranch, my mother, I. But I think it's important that it shows the visual thinking accurately. And Mick Jackson, the director, I'm the visual thinker. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. So a few here's a deep question for you. A few years back, I read a really interesting book called But What If We're Wrong by Chuck Klosterman. Have you heard of that one by chance? No, I have not. It's, it's interesting. Uh, the central idea of the book is that throughout history, human beings have been wrong about very big things. The world is flat. The sun orbits yeah. around the earth, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so his idea is that it's still possible that we're wrong about very big things that are very fundamental. Uh, so the question that he asks is, are we nearing the end of knowledge, meaning we're going to make smaller and smaller discoveries scientifically, or are we about to figure out that we're wrong about some very big things? I'm curious to know what your gut instinct is. Well, um, I remember asking a question that my biology teacher when I was a, either, I think it was a sophomore or a freshman, and I asked a very fundamental question about genetics. Mm -hmm. And they, they okay, you, you study the regular Mendelian stuff, you know, that, okay, in cattle, for example, a uh, black Angus bull is going to make a black coat on, uh, it's dominant, that's simple sure. Mendelian dominant in cattle, really, really simple. And I couldn't see how that could explain everything. I said, if I take two breeds of dog, Springer Spaniel and a Border Collie, and you put them together, and you make the, the what's called the F1 cross, you get a dog that looks like half and half. How does Mendelian genetics explain that? And you can breed 50 of them together, and you're still going to get dogs that look half and half, and he's going, it's just mutations. I never believed that. Well, we now know that that was totally wrong. Interesting. 
Uh, and and now I, I think it's, we're going to be questioning that maybe what is a gene. I'd almost rather say uh, the code of variations. And you know, what we used to think was junk DNA back in the 80s is the regulatory system. It'd be like calling your computer's operating system, you know, junk code. You take that code out, your computer's not going to work. Right, right. I, mean, I never accepted the concept of junk DNA. I understand. You've got to do something. I think we're going to have some breakthroughs in genetics. I think some very big things we've got to learn. It's going to be all mathematics. It's going to be yeah. all mathematical because you take the genome and you fold it up. Because the thing that's interesting is that the regulatory DNA for something is not located adjacent to the to the coding DNA that actually makes a protein. Maybe it all folds up in some mathematical thing. Interesting. I think there's something big we're going to find in that. Yeah. Uh, real, semi-related to that, something that surprised me in your book was when you talk about uh, your Appleseed project. And you have lots of great projects. I think 40 projects for kids that kids can do in this book. And one of them is to, is to plant an apple tree. And I was very interested to know that if I took a seed from, let's say, a red delicious apple and I plant it in the ground, it's not going to produce red delicious apples. Is that true? Uh, well, some plants are, are sterile clones, so, you know. Well, you had said that if I were to plant an apple tree these days, I would get a, a small, apples that are hard and small. Is there any well, way? Well, the, thing is, the thing is, is that a fruit that lives in the you know, natural world, okay, like we had a crab apple tree in our backyard. And we used to throw them at each other. <laughs> and <laughs> they were about that big. Okay, now the things that we've bred for food it's not going to survive in the wild because to make a big apple takes more nutrients. Right. So the wild type of anything yeah. tends to be smaller. I uh, corn, uh, you know, people get upset about GMOs. Um, corn, ear corn is nothing like the original ancestor of corn, which looks like grain with a grain plant with a wheat with corn kernels. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, you see that they the things that we've bred now, you've got to feed it a lot to support it. One of the issues we've got right now with beef cattle, you now people are looking to breed bigger beef cattle, you get more meat, less cows, it's sustainable. But the problem is the pasture land out west will not support large beef cows. Gotcha. It's only going to support small beef cows. Very because there's not enough, you know, years ago, our county agent back in the 70s said there's not enough groceries on that desert to feed those big cows. So a, a um, um, plants that we have now, you've got to feed them up more than they'd be getting in the wild. You know, there are some very large, you know, you know trees, but it takes energy to make things big. Right. And getting back to trees, one of my favorite sections of, in your book is on trees. You talk about dendrochronology. Can you tell us a little bit about what that field is all about? Well, you can look at tree rings and you can look at things like if the rings are further apart, then you would have had a, a lot of water and a lot of, you know, a lot of nutrients. So the tree grew more. Maybe it's a bad year. Then it grows less. You can count how old it is. Mm -hmm. But you can also look at when it went through some periods of stress, too, because it's not going to grow as much when it's stressed. Yeah. And you said that the, uh, that the founder of dendrochronology uh, actually could establish a 2,000 year old record of the climate. Is that possible? Are there trees that live 2,000 years well, old? Well, trees that live a long time. Well, yeah, you would be able to because you could tell the years that it rained a lot. Mm. The yeah. years that the tree had more um, water. You restrict water, it's not going to grow as much. So you'd be able to tell uh, also the temperature. Right, yeah. If you have a longer growing season, yeah. And it would grow more. Now, yeah. how old, do you know how old the oldest trees are? I, I went to Israel once and I was, uh, I, I saw a lot of olive trees and I wondered, are there any trees that are 2,000 years old? I'm not, I'm not sure, but there's, there's some that are, there's some of the sequoias that are very old. Right. Very interesting. And then there's um, other, other trees that don't last very long. And then you get problems with things like uh, an insect comes in from another country and it's killing trees. Gotcha. So, uh, something you talk about, you talk a lot about a, 
uh, about the environment and, and your hope for the environment in, in uh, you talk about crowdsourcing or citizen projects. I was well, curious to know. A lot of simple uh, bird counting as a citizen's project. Mm -hmm. National Geographic um, website's got a lot of good citizen projects. You know, collecting river samples for pollution would be another thing. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you can um, you can do and look up citizen science. I think the National Geographic would be a good place to start. Yeah, and that's something that a kid can do, right? Because yeah, all of, And yeah. they would have appropriate projects. So that's another for young kids. Yeah, so a lot of kids are really concerned about the environment, but these uh, some of these citizen projects get kids involved in, you know, in, in small ways, but they can feel like they're doing something and they actually are doing something. So I was really excited to read uh, that chapter in your book. Uh, something I think about a lot is how ancient civilizations observed the sun and stars and really learned about the universe from, you know, just simple observations, but methodical observations. Well, and navigation, you know, with, with very, very simple things is just amazing. Yeah. Do you, ever imagine, do you ever <laughs> imagine yourself living back in ancient times and what, if you could have made breakthrough observations, do you think that? that no, I would have been good at mechanical things because I had a really interesting trip to the patent office. And in fact, yeah. in Calling All Minds, I've got a lot of stuff in here about the patent office. And when it first started, visual thinkers like me, mechanical, clever devices, that kind of ruled the patent office. And people had to um, make a model and give it to the patent office. You know, so now you have things that are patented that are not you know, mechanical devices. But back in those times, I'm gonna bet you there were people that made armor, that made all kinds of things that um, probably were on the autism spectrum. That's that true. were really good at you know, their high-end skilled trades stuff. Yeah. And then you had mathematical people that, uh, you know, figured things out. Yeah, I had never thought about it in that term, in those terms, that some of the objects might be evidence of different kinds of, of thinking, different ways of thinking. Well, you think about in the medieval times, all these catapults they made. That's the kind of stuff I'd be good at that. I gotcha. look at suits of armor and I think, you know, I could think some guy in a shop making that. And he said, might be a really weird guy, but he makes the best armor. <laughs> We look at how how intricate that stuff is. There was a movie um, called Mad Max and Thunderdome. Back oh, in I saw that. Okay, and Tina Turner wore uh, chainmail armor. That was actually made across the street in in a factory across the street from where I'm sitting right now. So, um, you know, that must have taken a lot of work to to make that. Oh yeah, that was kind of a crazy movie. <laughs> Doctor Grant, one of my one of my other favorite chapters is about animals, specifically dogs. And you talk about how, how dogs were bred to do certain tasks over the centuries. Um, we have a Portuguese, I'm well, sorry. Dachshund, for example, was bred in the shape it is so it could go down and have badger holes and things like oh, really? that. And, um, you know, get burrowing animals to hunt them. That's why the shape they are, so they fit down the, the holes. And, and uh, you had dogs bred for, you know, sheep dogs. Yeah. Bred in good shape. Yeah. They were bred for specific things. And then you finally got into where people were breeding dogs just to be pets, the so lap dogs. Yes. Right. But, you know, I'm concerned right now what we're doing with a lot of dog breeding is we're breeding very extreme bulldogs mm. where they have trouble walking, they can't birth naturally, they have trouble breathing. Yeah. And if you go back and look at a picture in the New York Times called Bulldog's Dilemma, you can find it really easily <laughs> online. You got a bulldog that actually got some snout, it's got some leg. It's going to function, hmm. but we're breeding some extreme animals today. Yeah, on some of that, there's some animals that are a bit too extreme and food animals too. But I'm going to bash pets just as much, and and this is what I call bad becoming normal. When do you stop on breeding a massive head? Hmm. That's what the breed standard says, and you've got animals that aren't functioning very well. But most dog breeds in the beginning were bred for work. Right. And we have a working dog. We have a Portuguese water dog. His name is Thunder. And he's the happiest when he's fetching things from our pool. You can see it. He, it's like he knows what he's supposed to do. Um, so I wanted to test the theory on you. I, I feel like people are like dogs in a way uh, that I feel like people are born to do a certain kind of work and that you're happiest when you're doing that kind of work. Uh, so sometimes in graduation speak, speeches, I encourage students to figure out what kind of dog they are. Okay. Um, how far off am I? Do you think that that might be true with people? 
Well, I think there's different emotional types. Um, in some of my other animal books, I've, I've talked about the Jack Panskep emotional systems, and people have them and animals have them. You've got fear. Some animals are more fearful than others. Some people are more anxiety. You've got anger. Then you've got um, separation stress, that's grieving. and uh, Then you have seek. Seek's the urge to explore. Let's just look at Labrador retrievers. One Labrador retriever, all it wants to do is chase the ball. Another yep. Labrador retriever, more heavy set. He makes a great service dog, lay by the wheelchair all day. Does a really great service dog. That's the difference in the personality of the dog. And then, of course, you have sex. And then you've got the mother young nurturing. Some animals are going to groom and lick more. And then you have play, which would be happiness. And and different animals do have different amounts. There was a study done at New Mexico State University in cattle with GPS collars. And they said some of these cows are go-getters. And they'll go out and graze a whole bunch of pasture and there's others that um they just want to lay around the water hole and they call them the go-getter and the laid back and they'd be the same breed of cattle and you would have in, have these differences in, in their behavior yeah so some people are real active they want to be outdoors are very active yes right. um, and there's other people that um you know you know, like to sit at their computer. I've been out to the tech companies and I walked into this great big room. There was a hundred programmers in there, total silence, headphones popped on, doing all kinds of different things on their computers. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting that people, when I was reading your, the, the chapter on animals, of course, I was thinking a lot of, about people. And of course, um, you learned a lot about your yourself from animals. Can you talk us? Uh, well, talk I think about one that helped me with animals. I'm a visual thinker. You know, I talked about that in my book, um, Animals in Translation. And you know, that's how autism helped me understand animals. I don't think in language. Animals don't think in verbal language. So one of the things that helped me was, uh, you know, it was obvious for me to look at what animals were looking at. Right. I didn't realize that other people were not visual thinkers when I was like in the late thirties. Yeah. And that yeah. was a shock to me to find that out. And you said that horses actually taught you about, about your own mind or helped you understand yourself. Is, is that true? Or could you well, explain that? Horses were a very important part of my life when I was a, a teenager bullied and everything. I had friends who ride in horses. Um, I also had been put in charge of a school's horse barn. So I was um, proud of the fact that I had this job, I was responsible for the horse barn. And and I actually have a paper online called How Horses Help the Teenager with Autism Make Friends and Learn How to Work. And and I, well, being bullied, I'm a big proponent of getting kids involved with shared interests. Yes. Friends through shared interests. There was another kid, but it was banned was the thing where they got the shared interests. Understood. And you, you're famous, of course, for many things, but one of them is for writing a book called Thinking in Pictures. You, you say yeah. that animals think in pictures. Can you explain to us? Can you give us a primer on how, how, you, how you're different in, in that way? Well, I don't think in words. I'm also very associative in my thinking. Highly verbal thinkers are much more linear. Right now, I'm working on a book on visual thinking. And I'm working with my great co-writer, Betsy. And um, she is completely verbal. She rearranges my stuff so the verbal thinkers can understand it. Right. And I'm learning even more how a very verbal literary person, and she's a literary agent and a writer, is different than me, who thinks in pictures in much more associative manner. Now, yes. I think one of the ways that might help people to understand how visual thinking works is pretend I'm Google for images and give me a keyword, but give me something original and not something I can see. Either. I, I, I think of a really original keyword and I will tell you how my mind accesses my database of memories. Wow, that's really fascinating. And one of the themes of, well, give of me a this- keyword. Oh, you want me to give you one? Give me a keyword. Think of something really unique. Okay, so I'll asparagus. How my mind accesses it. Okay, asparagus. I'm sorry, I didn't understand your asparagus. Asparagus. Okay, well, I just had some the other night restaurant that I where I eat with my students, so I'm seeing that. Um, I'm seeing. Uh, we had, you know, now I'm seeing some other meals where I had asparagus. Huh. And now I'm seeing a field when we were kids where there was some wild asparagus and and we were exploring around in that. So now I've gotten into 
fields and places around my ha- my childhood house because I don't have huge databases of asparagus. So it's going to associate off of that. Yes. But that that's those uh, wild asparagus is how I, um, that was in a next door neighbor's yard. Yes. You know, where I lived. Now I'm seeing places where I played in the woods around my house. Now I'm seeing places I flew my kite. Yeah. Okay, yeah. now you see it has an associative link mm-hmm. that when you break it down, it makes sense. It's not random. I understand. Yes. There's an associative link. That's really fascinating. I, I was thinking about if I'm sitting around the fire pit with my friends and somebody talks about Diet Coke or broccoli or something like that, I'm going through the jokes about the funny things that, that I remember. Well, I, I just see it. I've got some Diet That's Coke in the refrigerator. I'm seeing that. Yeah. Now I'm seeing where my student and I got in a giggling fit about all the <laughs> cookies at the grocery store the other day. Um, because, I, okay, well, the Diet Coke and it, uh, <laughs> on the plastic the, the thing with the rings to hold it. And then, and now that got me thinking about the grocery store. That's amazing. I love yeah, it. Thank I, you. Tend, I tend to pull up real recent memories. Yes. Or older memories, either t- or real recent things. The asparagus is real recent. Yeah, that's very interesting. And thank you so much for giving us a peek into your mind. That's that's really cool. Yeah, you see, I don't, I wouldn't be thinking of jokes. I just start seeing right. like PowerPoint slides come up. Uh, I'm sparing it. Okay, the restaurant's name is Simmer. And I had some salmon and I had asparagus with it. Gotcha. It was the other night. Well, Dr. Grandin, we are now, I've, I've hogged you for so long. We have a few minutes for questions from the audience. And Pat Raftus just asked, how do you build up images in your database when you have no experience with them? I'm going to turn on these backlights. Okay, when I have no experience, well, I can read about them. And when I read a book, I, I, um, I, I convert the book into pictures. Like if I read a science fiction book and it's describing some far off planet, I make pictures. Very fascinating. Well, if they said that some alien life form was like a certain kind of flower, I'd have to know what that flower looked like in I order see. to create the images. That. But basically, I can read when I read a book, it's like a movie. Now I'm not I, I don't like mystery novels because they they got the plots are too complicated. I like stuff that just describes, you know, like interesting places where somebody went. Um, and then as I gotten older, my thinking has gotten better because I got way more pictures in the database. Uh, and that's why you got to get, you got to fill that database. You got to get autistic kids out experiencing a lot of things. Because even in my design work, I went to all these feed yards. And so now I have pictures of gates and fences and the different components. Gotcha. That's really cool. really cool. Um, so let's, Kim, what we're going to do is we're going to take a few questions right from the ask a question section. And I'll keep an eye on the right-hand side to see if anything uh, bumps up. Um, so, Kim, do you have anything good? Yes. Uh, Gail would like to know, do you think we will learn that some of the quote-unquote facts we know about autism today are wrong in the future? Well, first of all, you're not going to find an autism gene. Well, I'm curious. I had a chance to have my genome scanned and get it published as a scientific paper. And one of the things that learned, they ain't going to find the autism gene. There were four journal art reviewer, reviewers that hated that paper because they're looking for the autism gene. It's all code variations. Now, here's a great paper. Genomic trade-offs are autism and schizophrenia, the steep price for a human brain. Genomic trade-offs are autism and schizophrenia, the steep price for a human brain, the same code that makes the brain big in humans, also involved with autism and schizophrenia, and kind of a messy proposition, all these stem cells rapidly growing, and it's it's just code variation. You're not going to find the autism gene. Now, we found genes for why my skin is horrible and my teeth are horrible. We found that. That popped right out. That was more simpler genetics. Found out I have a bleeding disorder. Don't give me too much heparin. I could die. I found that out. Real important thing to find out. Um, but I think the autism is, is it's embedded in what makes our brains big. Because if you look at half of the population, 
the brains are going to be more interested in things like that that ship stuck in the canal. I had to follow that. It's really interesting. Um, interesting how they got it out too. Um, and then you're going to have the half of the population where the brains are more social emotional. So half the population is a little bit more towards the thinking and the cognitive. Now, at what point, as you move less social, do you slap a label on it? Huh. It's a true continuous trait. See, this is one of the problems. It isn't like I've got a, a certain uh, thing that made my skin horrible. That was something a lot more specific. And and um, there isn't going to be an autism gene. It's embedded in the same genes that make your brain big. Um, and I think it's going to I think it's going to question this concept of a gene mm -hmm. uh, on the traits where things just sort of mix together, like mixing together two breeds of dog. And when you just when you have the F1 cross where you mom and dad are different, distinct dog breeds, you can usually look at the offspring and you can say, yeah, it's got some German Shepherd in it, it's got some Australian healer in it. Um, they mix half and half. Interesting. Oh, very insightful. And, um, and uh, uh, it's mostly genetic. But the thing about an autistic person, I've had people say, oh, we got him out of a job at an office supply store and he just blossomed. You know, you've huh. got to be careful with the multitasking. We're not good at multitasking. We're not good at a lot of chaotic, fast moving stuff. But you've got to get the autistic person out because I'm a bottom up thinker. You've got to get me out and fill the database up so that my Google search engine's got more stuff to search. Right. That's, that's fantastic. Um, it, so, Kim, can you give us another question? I see that the questions are filling up. I love this question. So, uh, read him, VB Media. If we give you a word about emotions, like love, peace, kindness, what picture do you associate it with? Well, love, I'm saying the love bug. I'm seeing the Beatles song, love, love, love. Kindness, when I was in elementary school, we had a poster about being kind to animals. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see specific things like that. I don't really have abstract thinking. Mm -hmm. All the reason I got the Hubble Space Telescope on my refrigerator is I love the deep space mm -hmm. field. 100 galaxies. And let me tell you, the guy who took that picture, NASA almost turned down his grant proposal. You know what his grant proposal was? He was going to take his super valuable Hubble observing time and point it at nothing. <laughs> and he found 100 galaxies. They almost turned down the grant. Single uh -huh. most important picture the Hubble took. Fascinating. That's the Hubble depth field. Is that correct? Yeah, Hubble deep space field. Deep hundreds space. of galaxies. I look at that and I go. <laughs> almost didn't happen. Get the jackpot doing that. That yeah. almost got turned down. Uh, Dr. Dr. Grandin, we have a question uh, from, let's see, from Doreen Dix. She said she loves uh, your book, Different Not Less. It's so powerful. But what's the one thing you would share with parents who have just had a child? diagnosed with autism a little kid yeah okay if you have a three-year-old that's not talking you need to be getting into therapy right away and i would recommend this book my most basic book on autism for parents and teachers the way i see it i'd recommend getting that lots of little short chapters i was in really good speech therapy by two and a half wow. with a lot of emphasis on learning how to wait and take turns mm -hmm. so don't wait I know in a lot of places, there's no services. Well, get some grandmothers to come in. The mom can't do it all herself. She's going to go stress out. You've got to get some help. But a teacher needs to be spending two to three hours a day with that kid, interacting with them, where you get progress, more speech, more uh, uh, better able to wait and take turns, skills like brushing your teeth and dressing and basic skills. But you don't want to wait. You already have a diagnosis. He's not talking and he doesn't engage with people. Uh, you got to get working on it. Now, the thing is, I looked very severe at age three. If this is a real little kid, you don't know how they're going to come out. And then some of the nonverbal individuals with an autism label can type independently and actually have a good brain inside, but they can't control their movements and their visual system, uh, the, the circuits back here that Put the graphics file together they don't work everything scrambled you know the pixelating image like like on this kind of a conference when it screws up it just freezes and crashes but on the satellite tvs you get um you get pixelation and right. there's uh 
you get sensory systems, especially seeing is not working right, even though the eyes are okay. And my mother is an autism advocate, and she said that kids can get diagnosed as young as 18 months. Is that yeah. right? That's well, amazing. the first thing you look for is like babies have joint attention. Mm -hmm. You know, you say, now look at the birdie. Does he, do, you, do you have that? You know, the little, they don't play a little peekaboo games and stuff like that. I didn't do that. But I would say at that point, it might be a kid at risk. What you want to do is just increase your interaction with that kid. What you don't want to do is just sit them in the corner. But you do have to be careful not to force them into sensory overload. There's been some right. old rough types of therapy that we use that some advocates despise <coughs> because <coughs> they were forced into sensory overload. And you Understood. don't want to do that. That sounds like a good advice. Um, Kim, what we're going to do is we're going to take two more questions. I know there's 24 questions in the, in the queue, but it, uh, we don't have that much time. So why don't we do two more questions? Pick your best ones. Okay. So this is from, uh, this is from one of our teachers whose students were there today. And one of her students wanted to know, what would you say to a kid who doesn't have the support that you had from your mom? Uh, I, that I have to get more information. That's the kind of verbal, very vague question. I've got to get what the age is. Okay, if it's a three-year-old and there's no support, this is where you go to your church or your community group. If you need to ask for help, I'd get some grandmothers working on that child. Uh, then get uh, the way I see it. There's some other books you could get and you start working on this kid. That's if it's a three-year-old. Okay, now when I was in high school, I'm the worst part of my life of bullying and teasing. I got kicked out of the school for fighting. Well, that's where maybe the shop teacher could help turn the kid around if he's a visual player. Um, I worked with skilled tradespeople that were saved by a single welding class. And they were just as autistic as they could be. So that's too vague. I, I have to have yeah, more. She's a middle school teacher. So it would be a middle school kid. It's a middle school so probably, kid. Yeah, fifth or sixth grade. Out. I gotta find out what his problem is. Mm. Is it sensory? Some of these kids are bored doing baby work and math. He's good yeah. at math, move them ahead, move them ahead. I couldn't read when I was eight. And mother homeschooled me in phonics. Another kid, phonics is horrible. So you um, you got to use what works. I need more information about this kid before I can make a recommendation. Right. And See, Kim, that's too vague. Verbal thinking tends to get too vague. I got to ask. <laughs> Kim, Kim, let's have our last question of the okay. night from the audience. So Jonathan would like to know, what is your favorite memory from your childhood? Well, I just remember, um, well, I had a, we, we had some Christmas tr uh, traditions I really liked, where on the night before Christmas, we would um, put, um, each member of the family would take turns putting the ornaments on the tree. I really enjoyed doing that. And we'd have, uh, you know, we'd charcoal boil some stuff, you know, some meat. And, but I really liked our Christmas, the way we decorated the tree. So it would take like two or three hours to decorate the tree with everybody taking turns. And we had decorations we saved from year to year. I remember some uh, glass birds that had kind of a fiber tails that had little clamps that perched on the branches. That's cool. Well, Dr. Grand, I wanted to say that one of the things I enjoyed the most about your book was how direct you were and how how much you helped a person like myself understand the way that you think. I think one of your greatest gifts, and you have many, is is being able to to explain to people what it's like uh, to, to, to think like you. And I wanted to say, especially during Autism Awareness Month, a April, um, I wanted to say thank you so much for, for uh, talking to us. You reached so many people tonight. Um, you know, you're a gift to the world, and we, we so appreciate getting to spend some time with you tonight. Well, it was really great to be here and I'd be happy to answer a few more questions. I mean, I can go a little bit longer if you want. Great, you wanna, Kim, you yeah, wanna- I can, go, I can go a few, a little bit longer. Great, let's do it. I have 22 questions I, I see on the <laughs> Let's <laughs> have we do a cutoff. We're in bonus time now. Let's let's do a cutoff at, um, at in five minutes, Kim, at 7.57. Okay. So if we All have right. some questions. Okay, I'm gonna throw them out there. So Sarah would like to know, she says, my daughter enjoys physics and statistics. Do you use those in your studies? Well, I yes, because in scientific experiment, you have to determine physics. I don't use much. That I'm gonna leave that to the mathematicians, but you do an experiment, you've gotta see if your results are statistically significant. So that I would do, and she's into physics. Um, yeah, go for it. 
And the other thing I'm going to say is internships when you're in college. Try on jobs. You could get, you know, you're good in physics. You, there's all kinds of interesting stuff you could get into. Go for it. Um, maybe uh, study some more harder stuff. Oh, Go for great. it. And then Alexander would like to know, what books do you like to read best? Well, I love just reading science. I mean, science and nature are my, you know, breakfast reading. I just find that kind of stuff just super interesting. That's fascinating. Again, Kim, keep going. Yep. And J.E. Guarino would like to know, not only Kids for Citizens projects, do you have any ideas that an older women's group could do for an environmental citizens project? Do the same ones that the kids do. Uh, yeah. Do the same <laughs> projects. Uh, you can do them. Does, you know, and they, they're open to everybody. Yeah, um, you can track butterflies, frogs. Right, butterflies. That would be one of the things you can do. Birds, uh, migration. And Dr. Grand, did, did you, were you, uh, do you remember SETI at home? Yeah, they, um, I remember when I was in the 90s, when all of our computers, when they went, in, went into idle mode, they started oh, searching yeah, for I, alien. I didn't I get involved in that. And they were trying to find things out in the universe. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I like the idea of crowdsourcing like that. It's very cool. Now there's so many other. Now, this is a question from Jesse, and she has been wondering if she's the only kid on here. She's like, I'm 10. <laughs> so she's asked two questions. She wants to know if you like social studies and what is your favorite animal? Well, I really like um, cattle. That's I really like cattle a whole lot. Social studies was not my favorite subject. One of my favorite subjects was biology. And I was not a good student in high school, but the one class that always got a good grade in was biology. I just found that so interesting. Wow. And then Alexander would like you to, um, can you tell me more about cows? <laughs> you know, um, cows, when they're um, calm, grazing, they're, they can be really gentle animals. Um, they get scared. They gotta be, you don't want to get cattle scared because they can get scared really easily. It's something you don't want to do with them. But if you just sit out in the middle of the field, they'll just come up and lick you. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen lots of pictures during the pandemic of people sitting with cows, with cows resting their head in people's laps, and I couldn't well, tell. They'll do that. They'll do that. And if you stand, they won't come up. But if you sit, they'll come up to you. That's I would be cautious with the uh, mature bulls. Yeah. All right, Kim, how about one more question to top okay. us off for the night? So here is a question um, from Dana. Do you feel that screens and games can be a positive influence for an autistic child who's 10 years old that also lives a balanced life being active and spending time outdoors? Well, I think some of the video game playing has got to be limited. You've, I've seen young adults that are on there, you know, like 15 hours a day, 10 hours a day, and not doing anything else. I mean, I, would, I absolutely do not believe in banning video games. I would not do that. But there's a lot of kids where it needs to be limited because I'm seeing some really bad things when they get into their 20s, you know, get out and have a life and do things or they're in the bedroom all day playing video games. I've also heard some success stories of three young adults in different places getting weaned off of video games because it tends to be the visual thinkers like me into car mechanics. And one of them is fixing trains for the railroad and they love them. And these are true stories. Uh, but I'm seeing too many kids going nowhere, playing video games to the excess. And there is research literature in my book, The Way I See It. I review some of the studies where kids on the autism spectrum are more likely to get into problematic video game use. Now there is some good socialization with the games where you can talk to other people. Yeah. And so that uh, you, you give them the amount of time they can have in a week, they could budget their time for the big Fortnite tournament or whatever thing. <laughs> Um, but it's got to be limited. Um, they just can't be doing that all day. Mother limited TV with me. It was an hour on weeknights and two hours on a day on Saturday and Sunday. Right. Well, like I said, I feel, I feel like I missed out. I didn't do enough uh, spending time outdoors. And I spent a lot of time outdoors as a kid. But well, and it's just spending time. Um, I'm seeing a lot of kids today. I think one of the worst things the schools did was taking out music, theater, woodworking, art, sewing cooking, welding, auto mechanics. You've got kids growing up today 
that aren't getting exposed to enough stuff to find out what they might want to do. They're totally yeah. removed from the world of the practical. And we're getting into some problems with some stuff we don't know how to build, including the state-of-the-art electronic chip-making machine. It's from Holland. Hmm. We're paying the price now for taking this stuff out of the schools. Right. State-of-the-art poultry processing plant, all the equipment's from Holland. Right. Interesting. And this goes back to stuff with skilled trades. And this is stuff that I'm getting really adamant right now. And that's why I was tracking down Mars rover cameras. Because the tendency for educators to stick their nose up at skilled trades. You need us. We've got electrical power grids falling apart. I, we, and my kind of mind cares about that stuff. Yeah. No, well, you wouldn't like it if the lights went off. <laughs> You've got to have no. people that are out there fixing these things. And, and, and uh, we need, you know, in my TED talk, the world needs all the different kinds of minds. And the skills can be complementary. Right. And I'm worried that my kind of mind's getting screened out. I can't, we can't do algebra. It's too abstract. I don't have real abstract thinking. I don't have yeah. abstract. You know, when you say the word abstract, I'm seeing a summary of scientific journal articles right. called an abstract. <laughs> I'm seeing abstract paintings that my mother had in the house when I was a child. Mm -hmm. That's so I'm seeing some stuff at the Guggenheim Museum. Yes. Interesting. I'm seeing that picture where they, the Pollock, where they splattered the paint all over everything. Yeah. Abstract. So it's Very either going to be a journal article summary or it's um, art that is not representational. But it's also not pattern. Like, um, you know, tiling art, that's patterns. Understood. Understood. Abstract. I mean, it's, they talk about some big concepts in philosophy, and I'm going, I don't know. I'll just look at the Hubble Deep Space. <laughs> Think about those things, and I, I, I really loved finding out about that scientist. And almost got his grant proposal turned down. Right. Well, Dr. Grandin, our time really is up. Thank you for the bonus time. I'm sure everybody here appreciates it. You've been getting a lot of love in the right hand column and yes. from a lot of our fans. So many thank love. You so, much. so much love. Thank you again so much for oh, this. Oh, thank you so much. I'm just reading the column here. Yes, <laughs> you thank can read you all so night. Much. And I. Have I have to read wonderful I have time and i guess it's time to leave the meeting and um, thank you very much for having me thank yes. you we thank hope to see you so down the road and uh, everything well, well, click we'll the there. button at the bottom Bye -bye. and um okay. we will send you a signed book plate and the book thank awesome. you so much all right Take thanks care.